My name is Rick O'Connor. I'm the executive director of the Risk Five Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that looks after the ISA itself. And in the booth, we have seven different member companies with demos of different Risk Five technology uh, tools and, and IP and, and uh, devices. So make sure you check everybody out. And this talk is going to provide an overview of the ISA, what it is, where it came from and the foundation itself and the, the uh, growth of the ecosystem. So, quick show of hands, before you guys walked down the aisle and saw the RISC-V logo, who here heard about RISC-V before the show? That's good, that's good. First time I gave a talk here two years ago, nobody put their hand up, they had no idea what was going on. Oh, and the other thing is, yeah, that's a five, right? Roman numeral V is in five, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's the fifth generation of risk research. That's what the V is for. So we'll talk a little bit about the ecosystem because, okay, we're here with a nice big booth. You see lots of logos all over the wall. It's pretty impressive what's happened over the last few years from a, a, a nice, humble project at UC Berkeley to, to what we have now. So, just using the attendees at our workshops as a proxy for interest or growth or adoption, just for whatever, whatever metric you want to use, just the attendees. It's really taken off like a hockey stick over the last 12 to 18 months. Last December uh, in Santa Clara, at the Santa Clara Convention Center, we hosted our first, what we call the RISC V Summit. And it was an exhibit space like this only not as many booths as Embedded World, but there was 30 some odd uh, exhibitors, 29 exhibitors in the booth. Uh, we had 59 uh, uh, sessions over uh, multi-day tracks, more than 250 abstracts submitted to our, our program committee to choose the papers and, pap and uh, presentations that were there, and over a thousand attendees. I think we ended up with 1,150 or something like that in terms of uh, actual attendees for the, for the event. So it was very, very uh, successful, and we're quite proud of that. On the membership front, we just issued a release that we're now over 235 members. That includes universities, research labs, major corporations, and individuals around the world. Uh, started the foundation in August of 2015 with, with zero members and you can see what the growth rate has been. So if, again, you can use the attendees of workshops and events in the last slide, or use a membership growth as proxies to what's going on in, in the marketplace. And if you don't think that's interesting, um, this is a, a slide that's always out of date because every week in my inbox, there's a new membership agreement that I'm reviewing and signing off and we're adding new logos. So the industry momentum behind RISC-V is truly amazing. I've been involved in a number of open standards over the course of my career, and I have not seen anything being adopted at the pace that RISC-V is being adopted at. What is, what is this about? What's the fuss about? I mean, who cares? It's just an ISA. I mean, why? How did we get here? So, as you might know, this started out uh, at UC Berkeley as a research project back in, in 2010. Uh, clearly, so for those of you that are old like me, you might remember a guy named Patterson, and you might have a, a, uh, a Patterson and Hennessy textbook at some point that you used. Well, it's, it's that lab, Dave Patterson's uh, lab, and in fact, Dave is uh, accredited with coining the term risk. He started the original risk research back in the 80s, and the five, is, is uh, as I said earlier, the fifth generation of risk research out of UC Berkeley. So back in 2010, that team was looking at, okay, we're gonna refresh the university curriculum and teaching tools around uh, processor architecture. What can, we, what, what can we use? We've done many things before. Obviously, industry standards were options. Um, but if I'm new to microarchitecture and processor design, throwing something like an x86 at me or an ARM device at me might be a little overwhelming if I'm an undergrad, right? So way too complex um, as a teaching tool. So back then they said, okay, well, we've done it before. We'll start from scratch. We'll just do our own thing in the spring uh, of 2010 and have it ready in the, for the fall semester uh, later that year. 
And that, that three month project took about four years because the more, they, the more they got into it, the more work they wanted to do. Many, many, many tape outs later. Um, the first frozen be uh, spec for the, uh, for the base spec uh, was released in May of 2014. And as I said before, this represents the fifth generation of research uh, out of that lab. And what happened along the way, as researchers like to do, is they publish papers and articles and they get peer reviewed and feedback. Well, along, along that journey, unbeknownst to them, there was more and more industry take up uh, around the research. In fact, when they would change something, someone can, would come back to them and say, hey, wait a minute, you can't change that. That was really good, what you did in that last version. Put it back. So they, they started to realize that, hey, this is a project that's going to needs to live outside the four walls of Berkeley, so to speak. And that's how we decided to create the RISC V Foundation so that the, the roadmap and the specification stack and the evolution of those specs is managed by the foundation and, and group of companies. So in August of 2015, we filed articles of incorporation to, uh, to create a nonprofit uh, foundation to govern the ISA. So why do we really care? Uh, and if we just take as an example uh, a, a modern SOC, so we've got the Tegra SOC up here from NVIDIA, and, and kind of rip the lid off and have a look inside, there's many, many, many different processors on this SOC. Purpose-built, you know, radio and audio DSPs, for instance, graphics processors, the actual application processor, which is what most people see with the API, and all kinds of other cores that are embedded deeply into the SOC with firmware that the SOC designer provides. Nobody ever sees any of that stuff. Dozens and dozens of different cores, different ISAs, different tool chains, all on the same SOC. They all have their own uh, uh, tool chain and, uh, and, uh, and software stack to support them, as well as homegrown uh, cores. So, one of the things that's, that, as, you know, when you look at this from a pure, purity engineering standpoint, if you had no idea what the legacy was and how we got to that kind of integration, this is the most obvious question. Do all of these ISAs really have to be different on all of those different cores that are in that ISA, on that SOC? And, and do they need to be proprietary? If you think about our industry, um, there's an open standard for pretty much every interface in a computing system today. There isn't for an ISA, which is kind of weird. So what if, what if in fact there was a free and open ISA that you could use across all of these different cores? Well, we, we kind of think there is, right? And that's, that's why we're all here together today in, a, in the RISC-V booth. So what's so different about RISC-V? Well, it's, it's very, very simple. I mean, obviously 25, 30 years of hindsight um, to look back at some of the original RISC concepts and designs from the 80s. Um, gives you a significant advantage in terms of looking at, uh, at what, you, what you might do differently. So it's far smaller than most commercial ISAs, and I'll talk about how, to, how we achieve that in a, in a moment. It's also a clean slate design with, with a lot of attention taken to separating implementation microarchitecture techniques from the ISA itself. So there's nothing baked into the ISA spec that presupposes how you're going to implement the circuit uh, to implement that instruction. And, and there was a lot of care to, uh, that was taken for that. And it's, it's modular. This is probably the thing that is the most interesting and makes, it, makes the ISA applicable to a wide range of applications from a deeply embedded IoT core right through to a server class machine. And that each of the, the ISA is carved up into a set of extensions or modules that only contain the instructions that you would need for that particular type of device. And we'll talk about that in a second. And building on that modularity, it's designed to be extensible. So there's a, there's a reserve portion of the opcode space that will never be touched, that you can roll your own secret sauce into if you've got a, a purpose-built hardware accelerator that you're trying to, uh, trying to stitch in with an application processor, then uh, you can design your own custom instructions. Clearly, you'd need to support those in your tool chain and that'll never get trampled on in that reserved opcode space, user space. 
And another thing that we use the modularity around is uh, to provide stability. So when we release an extension, that extension will never, ever, 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 ever get changed. If you produce a device that, that implements that extension, it will always run code that was uh, meant to use those instructions. And if, if and when we add new functionality, it'll be added through a new, another extension that you would support in, in a subsequent device. So that stability can be, can be built on, on and counted on um, uh, for, in perpetuity. So that's very cool. So that's the Reader's Digest tour of the ISA. Talk a little bit about the foundation and the governance of, of how we look after the ISA. So as I said earlier, we incorporated the ISA in the August of 2015 as a, a nonprofit. Uh, in, uh, in the U.S. We created membership agreements uh, through basically a, a, and bylaws through a collaboration of some early adopter members and released those in, in 2016. All of the logos and members that you see here on the wall, they've all signed the exact same membership agreement. There are no exceptions. There's no side letters. There's I, I spend a fair amount of my time uh, talking to legal counsel of every new member as they come on and explain to them what's in the membership agreement, and then they eventually just sign it. Um, and so it's pretty, that's pretty powerful. And the main purpose for the foundation is that the ISA remain free and open for all users. Um, you don't have to be a member to use it. You, you, if you want to help contribute to the extension of the roadmap and so on, then it's within the foundation is where we do that work. Also, um, a set of compliance suites uh, open source compliance suites so that when I develop a RISC-V device and you develop a RISC-V device, we can both say that that's RISC-V compliant with IMAFD, for instance, as a, as a set of extensions, and we know what that means if we both execute the same compliance suites. So we're, that's, that, that's active work that, um, uh, that is uh, underway within the foundation today. And then to protect the standard, the only thing that's actually licensed is the trademark, and that's to make sure that uh, when I put that logo on my de device uh, and say my device is compliant, you know what that means. So it's a, just a little bit of a, a means of making sure that everybody can rely on uh, one solid ecosystem around the, around the ISA. So the, the foundation is organized with a board of directors that basically drives a series of uh, committees. So the three main standing committees are the technical committee, it was chaired by Yunsup Lee at Sci Five, and Yunsup was one of the PhD uh, uh, grads from uh, from Berkeley that pioneered the original RISC Five work. There's a security standing committee chaired by Elena Hatches from Rambus, and a marketing committee chaired by Ted Marina from Western Digital. And then underneath those committees, there's various task groups that either look after different extensions, have different security projects, or on the marketing side manage events like this so when member companies you know decide to come to an event like this there's a small group that works together to, to organize and plan that and in order to participate in any of these uh, committees or task groups you need to be a member of the foundation and basically that's that that's to ensure that we're all playing by the same rules that are defined in the bylaws and membership agreements so the board of directors uh, is listed here. Uh, Kirsta is the chairman and uh, lead lead research professor at UC Berkeley uh, behind the initiative. And in fact, Kirsta is the owner of the trademarks, and the foundation manages the trademarks on Kirsta's behalf. Of course, you know who Dave is. Uh, he's actually retired from Berkeley now and is an architect at Google. That basically means he gets to do whatever he wants at Google. <laughs> Uh, Zvonimir from Western Digital, Charlie Hawk from BlueSpec, Rob Oshana from NXP, Fran Sistermans from NVIDIA, and Ted Spears from MicroSemi slash Microchip. So that's a, a quick Reader's Digest overview. It's only meant to be a 10 to 15 minute talk, and then we have lots of time for questions, so I'm happy to entertain them.